John 13 and verse 31. When Judas had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you. Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Lord, Simon Peter said to him, Where are you going? And Jesus answered, I am going where you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, Peter answered, Why, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you so. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. May God be pleased to bless to us this portion of his word this morning. It has been a joyful morning. We have come together to worship God. We have joined our voices and I trust our hearts in singing our praises to God. We have listened to a wee bit of what God has been doing in this place and we have seen some evidence of church growth in these new babies that God has brought to the family here. And what a joyous time it is when we, we see little ones coming into the families of the church and we, we see these new births and we rejoice with the families together. And uh, when a little one is born, a time, of course, of great delight and of great excitement. But I wonder, when was the last time you ever had a conversation about death and dying? You see, I find it interesting that in 2017, researchers at Harvard University completed a new study which showed that the expected mortality rate 
among humans is still 100%. I wonder how much they were paid to do their research. That, that, that given enough time, everyone dies. And yet death is the last thing we talk about. The 23rd Psalm is commonly referred to as the shepherd Psalm because of the introductory words, the Lord is my shepherd. It's also known as the, the hymn of the martyrs, a fact that we explored in an earlier sermon. But this psalm also bears the designation of the funeral psalm. For if ever a, a, a biblical text is quoted at a funeral service, nine times out of ten, it is the 23rd psalm, and especially the fourth verse. Psalm 23 and verse 4. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, given that, that, that Psalm 23 and verse 4 is the testimony of one of the Lord's sheep and is set within the context of what we commonly refer to as the, the valley of the shadow of death, my questions this morning are therefore these. What does a Christian's death mean, first of all, to those loved ones who have been left behind the flock? But then what does it mean to the one who has died, the sheep? And finally, what does it mean to the Lord who is our shepherd? First of all then, when death comes, to those who are left behind, what does it mean? What do we see? What do we feel? What do we experience? But the emotion of grief. To those who are left behind, there is the emotion of grief. The words of John 14 and verse 1, don't let your heart be troubled. The preceding chapters contain news of, of Jesus' intending exodus. He had spoken to his disciples about his coming departure. And that news had filled his followers with, with fear and with foreboding, with anxious thoughts and with troubled hearts. And that word trouble is a, a strong word suggesting agitation and great distress. Because you see, to them, some, something unthinkable was about to, to happen. Something that the disciples could just not comprehend. A loved one was going to leave them. The one in whom their, their hopes had rested. The one from whom their, their joy was derived. And the one in whom their faith was fixed. He was leaving them. He was departing from them. And so grief now became the dominant emotion. And grief, grief is many forms. And many triggers. Grief may show itself in anger, in denial, 
in bitterness, in resentment, in guilt, in emptiness. And it can be triggered by a number of things. You may experience guilt if you have to change your employer. You may experience grief when you lose a job. Or when sickness strikes. Or even when we have to take up retirement. A change of location. There are, there are many triggers to grief. But primarily, bereavement. Bereavement. Someone who has been significant in our life is no longer there. Their chair is empty. Their clothes still hang in the wardrobe. The toothbrush is still in the sink. The slippers are still beside the bed. The Bible still sits on the bedside table. Grief. The very emotion felt and showed by our Lord at the death of Lazarus. John chapter 11. You read verses 33 through 36. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her also crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. This man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, he weeps the death of a friend. And so we see grief in the Savior, openly expressed, unashamedly shown. And, and that's why personally I, I find it strange at times that within some Christian circles, to, to weep over a, a, a loved one taken from us is somehow regarded as a sign of, of weakness or, or unbelief. Yet, yet how, how tragic that we seek to, to deny or, or crush the very faculty that, that God has given to us to express our sorrow, to manifest our love, to show our loss. Because surely the Apostle's point in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14 is not that we're not to grieve, but that as Christians we do grieve, but not like those who don't have hope. There is such a thing as good grief. We see it in the Savior. But furthermore, we see it recorded in the Scriptures. When Jacob died and was, to use that delightful Old Testament term for death, when he was gathered to his people, Joseph threw himself on his father's body and wept over him and kissed him. The Egyptians mourned for 70 days. Then Joseph carried the body to Canaan, accompanied by a huge train of servants, of elders and relatives and friends and chariots and horsemen. And seven more days were spent in, and I quote, a very great and sorrowful lamentation. You think of Moses. God himself buried Moses. But the people of Israel wept for him for 30 days. You come to the New Testament. You read the death of Stephen. And what was said about him? 
Acts 8 and verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. You see grief in the Savior. You see grief throughout the Scriptures. And you see grief in the godliest, holiest of saints. Let me give you but one example. That saintly Robert Murray McShane. If if it's a, a name strange to you, McShane is regarded as probably the the most godly, holy minister of the gospel who has walked this planet. He died, I think, when he was 28 years of age, but left such an impact not only in Scotland, but the world through to today. But for this godly, saintly man, the death of his older brother David at the age of 26 was, was a blow to McShane that was almost too much for the servant of the Lord. And every year after that, Robert Murray McShane remembered the death of his brother. He grieved for him over that loss. I said I'd only give you one example, but let me refer you to C.S. Lewis and the great experience of grief he felt the death of his wife Joy over just after four years together. If you've never read it, get it and read it. A Grief Observed. A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis. It's Lewis's statement and journal of rediscovering faith in the face of death and isolation and grief. Jesus wept. But there was more. Because we read that he was moved and greatly troubled because Jesus saw what we so often fail to see. The old truth that, you know, we look in the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And what did the Savior see? He saw behind the grief. He saw what stood behind death itself. The sin that stood behind and caused the awful separation and grief. Jesus saw the the horror of sin. He saw the awfulness of sin. He saw the terrible effect of sin. That this, this is what sin does. It rips from your arms the one whom you loved so dearly. It is sin which causes this this terrible separation and this this gut-wrenching feeling of isolation and almost inconsolable grief. Sin causes havoc, my friends, in the human heart and in the home. And so we grieve because we live in a world which is plagued by sin and death. The words of Romans 5 and verse 12. Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all have sin. Depravity and death go together. And so to those left behind, there is the emotion of grief. But it's a grief tempered by grace. And it is a hurt that is softened by hope. Because my second part of the question, or second question, is this. What does death mean to those who die believing. We've looked at those who have left the flock. But what about the sheep that dies? Well, there is here the completion of grace. The completion 
of grace. How did John Newton put it? Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. What happens when a saint dies? There's the grace of a full redemption. You see, here and now, we we don't receive all the benefits and all the blessings Christ purchased for us at the cross. Here we we still have to fight daily the, the sin that so attracts us and yet so entangles us. And despite personal and consistent devotion and consecration and Bible reading and prayer and fellowship and so forth, we continue to fail miserably. But as the shepherd leads us into and through the valley of the shadow of death, we enter into the house of the Lord. And the truth of the text shines To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so the discovery is made of a a full salvation. The discovery is made that now for us there is no more sin. And there's no more sorrow. And there's no more sadness. And there's no more sickness. There's no more walking frames and walking sticks and wheelchairs. There's no more crutches or glasses or hearing aids. No, 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 says our Lord. Behold, I make all things new. There is a full redemption. All that Christ purchased for us is now ours. And thus there is a joyful reunion. A reunion with all those believing ones who have gone ahead of us. The grief experienced in this world now is replaced by the gain of an unbreakable and unending reunion. For we shall be together. Together with the Lord. No more division. No more denominations. No more differences. Because what will, what will unite us? And, and, and what will thrill us for all of eternity? Listen to the words of Annie Ross' cousin. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace. Not on the crown He giveth, but on His pierced hand. Because, you see, the Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. And so by God's grace, there will be a glorious reception. Have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? You know, we used to give it out as a Sunday school prize, but it's really a a wonderful theological book. It's a grand book, a great book. Let, let Let me read Christian's Entrance into Heaven. Listen as I read. Now, while they were drawing towards the gate, the gate of heaven, behold, a company of the heavenly hosts came out to meet them, to whom it was said by the other two shining ones, These are the men who have loved our Lord when they were in the world, and that they have left all for his holy name. And he has sent us to fetch them. And we have brought them thus far on their desired journey that they may go in and look their Redeemer in the face with joy. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
There came out also at this time to meet them several of the king's trumpeters, clothed in white and shining raiment, who with melodious noise and loud made even the heavens to echo with their sound. These trumpeters saluted Christian and his fellow with 10,000 welcomes from the world. And this they did with shouting and the sound of trumpet. This done, they compassed them round on every side. Some went before, some behind, and some on the right hand, and some on the left. Continually sounding as they went, with melodious noise and notes on high, so that the very sight was to them who could behold it, as if heaven itself was come down to meet them. My dear friend, my dear Christian brother and sister, this is what happens when a believer dies. The good shepherd gathers them. He is with them. He leads them through all and brings them to heaven itself to be met with songs of praises. As Bunyan put it, it's as though all heaven comes to meet and to greet and to welcome and to embrace. And heaven is filled with hallelujahs for another sheep has come home. My brother and sister in Christ, that it's what awaits us if death comes to us. If the Lord tarries and we die, the Good Shepherd will lead us through the valley of the shadow. And all heaven will come with the hallelujah chorus and welcome us home. When a Christian dies, those left behind experience the emotion of grief. When a Christian dies, for them they experience the completion of grace. And so thirdly, when a Christian dies, what does it mean to the Lord himself? What does it mean for the good shepherd? It means the revelation of his glory. The revelation of his glory. Let me remind you again, I've drawn attention to it in the past, but it's my favorite text. What Jesus desires and what he prays to the Father for, Father, I will that those that you've given me may be with me, so that they may be where I am, so that they may behold my glory, the glory that you gave me before the world was. This is the Son's desire that we might be enraptured by the splendor of His majesty. What was it that Cousins wrote? The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. What does the death of a saint mean to God? It means satisfaction. Satisfaction. The satisfaction of the work of God's Son. For what do we read in Isaiah 53 and verse 11? He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What does that mean? Well, Jesus saw both the, the anguish that awaited him at Calvary and the victory of his doing and dying that would be accomplished at Calvary. The words of Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endures the cross and despises the shame. Jesus saw the fruit that would come from his suffering, the redemption of the people that the Father had entrusted to him, because there's always that relational element to redemption. So that in the death of a believer and their immediate translation to the Father's house, the work of Christ at the cross is confirmed and affirmed. 
Because Christ's death was never in vain. Christ, my friends, never died hoping that sometime, someplace, someone would come to trust in Him. Because what was His name? You shall call Him Jesus. For He shall, not might, not maybe, not hopefully, not even possibly, but He shall save His people from their sin. And when a saint comes home, the son is satisfied with his work. Satisfaction. Vindication. The vindication of God's Word. That all the promises made and all the statements recorded and all the images portrayed... All have been fulfilled. God's promises to to purchase and to protect and to preserve and to present to Himself His people with exceeding joy comes to fruition. The truth of God's Word shall shine like a jewel from, from all eternity. For whosoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. And that will be vindicated. That will be proven to be true. That will be the testimony of all heaven's saints. And like the response of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon and all his glory, all in heaven will confess, you know, the half has never been told. And so for God, The homecoming of His children means satisfaction, vindication, and celebration. The celebration and the proclamation and the revelation and the adoration of His worth. The hallowing of His name. How amazing it will be. How vast. How divine. Listen to the words of Revelation 5. John says, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Oh, beloved, think of it. Think of heaven. The worship of heaven. The joy of heaven. The delight of heaven. And all who will be there. All from the nations. Red and yellow, black and white. All are precious in His sight. All encompassing. For everything we do there will will exalt Him and be to His praise and glory. And it will be open-hearted and full-hearted as like this morning we bring our praise and our anthems to Him. Worship freely given and joyfully expressed. And all absorbing. Because at last, at last, we shall be able to worship Him with sinless hearts and holy voices without distraction, but fully, completely, perfectly expressed worship. And so precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. For God Himself is the object of heaven's praise. So let me draw to a close. Because what can we say about these things? Let me say something, first of all, something practical. And then I want you to say something pastoral and then something personal. The topic of death, something practical. If you haven't already done so, 
plan your funeral now. I don't care how old you are, because you do not know the day of your departure. But get a piece of paper and write down what kind of service you want, who is to take part, what hymns or songs you want sung, what Bible readings you want taken. Write it down. Give a copy to a family member so that they know. Those of you who have been any form of pastoral ministry, I'm sure my dear brother Alec here will be able to recognize and understand and know that frequently you're called to a death of a saint, but nobody in the family is a believer. And they want to arrange the this, this service, which would not in any way reflect the life, the witness of the one who's gone. So my friends, write it down. Put it down. If you don't know what to do, what to look for, talk to me afterwards. We... We developed a sheet along with some funeral directors as to what could be helpful and useful. But if it's to be a memorial service, if it's to be a thanksgiving service, can I plead with you, remember family and friends and give them some time to mourn and to grieve. Family needs that. And they need time to express their grief in the company of others who love them. Mourning and grief is not sin. And it's not unbelief. So plan, give some thought to what you want in that service. Then pastorally, preserve your hope Preserve your hope of heaven by meditating on the promises of God and the the precepts of God. Memorize Psalm 23 and verse 4. Meditate on the depth of God's mercy, His amazing grace, the depth of His love. Meditate upon the the death and the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and trust in the merits of His cross. Meditate on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ because it's the it's the message of the resurrection. That, that points us to the fact, the foundational fact that death has been defeated. You know, in the early church, the Christian hope was firmly fixed on the resurrection, that great historic event. So, so read and feast in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and John 14 and feed, feed your faith so that it may overflow with, with hope, hope in God. Because the journey, the journey may be dark, but we can face it fearlessly, knowing that God is with us as we walk through this gloomy valley. And yes, we will leave behind loved ones, but focus on the fact that we're, we're going home to the Father's house where Jesus is, and where we're going to abide with Him forever, beholding His glory and we shall live happily ever after. Preserve your hope. And then personally, personally, prepare to die. Prepare to die. For unless the Lord returns, we shall all die some day. And the Bible says and warns us that it is appointed unto man not only to die, but after that to face the judgment. And so my personal question to you this morning is simply this. Where and how will you stand before the thrice holy God on that day. When you stand before Him on that time, and you will, and He says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What will your answer be? 
what will your answer be? If you are not a Christian here this morning, I don't ask what sins you have committed, but I do ask you if you've ever had a better offer than this. I quote the Scriptures, the Word of God. Whoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. God offers you freely pardon for all your sin, comfort in the day of trouble, shelter in the time of temptation, peace when you die, hope for the future, joy forevermore. And I pray the Spirit of God, without which the heart remains hard and the invitation is unavailing, that God by His Spirit this morning would be merciful to you and gracious this morning as He sets before each of us this morning the certainty of death and the reality of eternity. So where shall you spend it? Where shall I? Where shall you? Prepare to die. Prepare to meet your God. Flee from the wrath to come. Prepare to stand before this glorious God in all of His holiness and hear Him say, Why? Why should I let the likes of you into my heaven? You think about that, my friend. You give serious thought to that. Let us pray. Let us pray together. O oh God, write your word upon our hearts, for we do not know what a day or an hour will bring forth. But our Father, may the shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, restore a soul, renew a soul, revive a soul. And, O Father, that we might walk in the right paths. And when our time comes to enter the valley of the shadow, know that the shepherd is with us, that we are not alone. And know the hope that is held out for us, the glory that awaits us, that our fears may be stilled and our hearts can. Speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on Thee. Amen.